So, news on the Tory civil war front. We've actually had our first, well, challenger, shall we say, step up and articulate what it is exactly they are offering as being the leader of the Conservative Party. And shockingly enough, shockingly, shockingly, <laughs> shockingly enough, it is none other than da, 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 Pretty Patel. Um, yes, Patel, right out of the gate, um, dropping her plan and what she intends to do. So probably expect over the next couple of weeks or so, other, shall we say, potential leadership uh, candidates start dropping theirs. But we are going to go over this, so this might be quite a long video, but we are going to do a bit of skipping because uh, you just have a bit of preamble. But it's very interesting what she talks about and what she intends to do in her first 100 days. So a big part of her push is to give the party back to its members. And you might ask why that is. Well, why is that? You may remember Pretty Patel is part of the COD, that's the Conservative Democrat Association. And their whole reason for being came about because of the overthrowing of not only Boris Johnson, but the feeling that um, you know, the membership got cut out and how well, basically, if it had come down to a competition the membership would have elected Boris Johnson again. <laughs> and as we said at the time, are you insane? Even Tory MPs were like, no, we can't allow this to happen. And galvanized very much around Rishi Sunak because even they recognized the danger of allowing the membership to vote back in Boris Johnson. They, they knew that it would just be an absolute disaster lock after everything that had happened making Johnson the leader again showing no contrition no apologies or anything like that and if you think Rishi Sunak's loss would have been bad um you know at 121 seats Boris Johnson's loss could have been even worse because oh boy Johnson's popularity even at that time even now has fallen off a cliff edge completely since 2019. The whole Boris Johnson election magic, yeah, uh, completely gone. But this is why Patel wants to give the the members a, a, a more bigger say in what they do, because she and the rest of her little faction are all from the right wing of the party. They know how right wing the membership has become voting and putting in in ever increasing you know radical weird well weirdos like Jacob Reese Mogg like you know Steve Baker well like her like Liz Truss so yeah giving it over to the members yeah I, I, <laughs> um what a recipe for disaster. What, what a recipe for disaster. But we are going to go over her plan for her first 100 days and see what are the things she's got planned for the Conservatives. Um, but needs to say, it is interesting. But yeah, this is yet another recipe for disaster. But I don't think Patel's going to get there. Um, at the current rate she's been polling, she's only got about 10%. Um, as I said always, it's Kimmy Badlock's race to win, and unless something drastic happens, she's she's going to win it. Essentially, she'll get if she gets the final two, she wins it. So, as always, going back uh, on to this and see what crazy plan Pretty Patel has for her first one hundred days. But before we do that, um, please do remember to click on the Patreon page, the Buy Me Coffee link, the where well, you can well buy me coffee, the YouTube thank you button, the Pony Club down below as well. And of course, do remember to click on like, share, and of course, leave a comment down below on what you think this, um, this plan is going <laughs> to affect the Tory party, because it seems to me um, it could go very wrong very quickly, giving the members such power. Um, hmm. <laughs> That's for sure. So anyway, this comes from Conservative Home. Uh, actually, from Pretty Patel herself, uh, we must reform our party and give it back to the members. So let's skip on down uh, to here. 
So here we have. So yeah, that's a lot of massive preamble, but here we are. So, so if I have the privilege of being elected the next party leader, I have a clear first 100 day plan for CCHQ and a package of reforms. So what are you going to do? So first, I would undertake an urgent review of the party's financial position and campaign structure. We've been uh, we've been very tough and had a very difficult election politically, and we now face financial challenges too as we now recalibrate our role in opposition, implementing a new fundraising strategy and a budget for all the receipt of short money. So this is obviously something that doesn't get brought up too much that the Conservative Party seem to be in quite some financial straits. And this was because of Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson scared away a lot of the big donors, followed by Liz Truss, scared away a lot of the big donors. Rishi Sunak managed to bring some of them back, but not all of them came back. And as a result, they are now facing significant financial challenges. So that is something all the party leaders are going to have to deal with as a significant problem. Because if you haven't got money in the bank, then it becomes very, very difficult to campaign, to run election campaigns if there's a by-election or something like that. And especially in opposition, they are going to find that incredibly hard if they don't have the money to actually back them. And of course, with an ever-decreasing membership, as the rumor goes, that their membership has dropped substantially since the Boris Johnson days. Once again, scaring a lot of people off. You've got to reattract a lot of those people. That is going to be incredibly hard for them to do. So, continuing. Uh, we also need to get a uh, sharper now responding to the policies and announcements put out by the government and start to look at how we set the political agenda again rather than merely having to respond to it. Well, <laughs> You only get to set the political agenda when you are actually in power. <laughs> so, <laughs> but there you go. Uh, the mechanics, of course, of being opposition party are very different from our experience of being government. Uh, and I have done both, having worked for William Hague when he was leader. Uh, we must also now professionalize our campaigning and our approach uh, and support for the 2025 local elections when we are now defending most county councils and engage <clears throat> with colleagues now in Wales and Scotland over planning for the 2026 elections for the Senate and the Scottish Parliament. And those right there, by the way, probably going to be the biggest challenges for whoever is the next Tory leader. And if anything, if in 2025 you do not have a good local elections, if you lose seats rather than gain seats, it's not going to look good on you. And then if by 2026 you don't gain any seats in, in Wales or Scotland, well, you're going to be out. Put it that way. Whoever, whoever wins is going to be out. Maybe even sooner than that. If the local elections go really, really bad, oh, they will want to be getting a new leader in very, very quickly. You know, I've always said by 2029, there will be at least two or even three like conservative leadership elections by the next general election because they are in no fit state. They have not really done any proper retrospection or anything like that in their party. And it is insane to think that they can just carry on thinking on this ideological view that everything was all right, everything was all perfect, and yet pretty Patel focusing on almost somewhat meaningless, meaningless things because they need to look at what are they actually going to offer. So back to this as well. So we can only get ready to fight and to win at the next general election if we improve all the aspects of the campaigning tools and rebuild trust by winning seats in local elections, uh, returning to our position as the largest party in local government and supporting our colleagues in Wales, Northern Ireland uh, and Scotland in the recent in the years ahead. But again, what are you going to offer? What is it exactly you are going to offer in these local seats? Yes, I'll tell you what, there's another <laughs> there's another story recently on Conservative Firm, also today, from a from a Tory who's saying, Oh, if we believe in lower taxes, then we should be lowering council tax. When a number of a lot of 
councils are looking at very dire financial straits. You've got a councillor here who basically says all the Tory councils should start cutting their their council tax. Once again, it all comes back to the argument. If you want to cut tax, what exactly should these local councils no longer provide as a service? And I'll tell you this now, the comments did not go very well. <laughs> and of course, this also goes back to one of the very first councils that actually went bankrupt was a conservative council doing exactly that. Not too long after austerity, they followed uh, you know, Osborne's example and they ended up going bankrupt. Uh, so we must also now enhance our campaign toolkit, improve uh, improved, uh, the, proved the incumbency package of support and a comprehensive digital offer to support our MPs and candidates and roll this out to target seats. Uh, a localized approach to incumbency will be now effective as we're now speaking to conservatives uh, values of public service. Um, again, you've got to actually prove that the conservatives are good for public service when you've got a couple of years um, especially the last, what, five or six of the Conservatives didn't really seem that publicly service-driven. Uh, we must amp amplify local record of delivery for Conservatives. Candidates shouldn't have to wait until they're elected to start accomplishing things in their area. Uh, we cannot allow ourselves to fall behind uh, political uh, opponents in any aspect of campaigning, creating new digital footprints, uh, using the utmost effective ways of communicating with and beyond our base. So basically, you need to get more digital. Um, I, I, I'd say this isn't just a problem for the Conservatives. I'd say this is probably a problem for a lot more, uh, you know, parties as well. Um, so this is where it gets gets interesting. So to begin with, reform of CCHQ. This is Conservative Party HQ, uh, and its structures within the first one hundred days. I will draw upon the long-standing professional campaign experiences of colleagues such as Richard Murphy and Stephen Bell, who I served with on the party board, regional leaders such as John Flack and Simon Jones. I also have a wider plan to win back the trust and confidence of our delegated party members who want their party back and who want to be more engaged and heard. So again, what exactly are you going to do? You're just going to bring these people in uh, that you worked with. Essentially, that seems to me Patel taking over in some ways, or at least her faction, shall we say, taking over the, the Conservative Party, maybe even cementing their rule. Um, this is what this always has come across as when Patel and others, or we've heard others or stuff from uh, the Conservative Democratic Organization. We want to sort of cement our rule and keep out these centrists because, you know, some of these candidates aren't real Tories. <laughs> Um, and of course, they've been very vocal about getting rid of them. Uh, so, more engaged. Uh, without our members, we are nothing, but energizing and, and uh, appreciated membership will now play a vital role in the recovery and in winning back the trust of the British people. How does any of that win back the trust of the British people? Everything you have mentioned so far is entirely focused navel gazing at your own party. That does not win back the trust of the British people. Um, I've been listening to our members for many years and have long believed that there is now a democratic deficit in our party. I will address this through a package of reforms, including the an elected party chair chosen by members. Once again, that could be backfire on them massively because the party is incredibly right wing. You end up electing uh, a party chair, party chair who will have immense power, immense power within the non-parliamentary party to be able to decide um, direction, policy, candidate lists. What did I say before about cementing their rule in the party? They will now be accountable to our members and now work with the party board and representatives come across the party and parliamentary team to rebuild the CCHQ, as well as being the voice for the grassroots at the top table when key decisions are made. Uh, so that's the role of the CCHQ and how she sees it. I, once again, seem to be thinking, and, and this is really coming across, it is complete and absolute control of the party. Um, really, really is on that. Um, 
so this is the, also the other one that's that's interesting. So I would also support the local ascensions in recruiting new mem members, reaching out to now the brightest and best in their local communities who share our values, while also encouraging existing members with talent and experience to be uh, the, the leaders of tomorrow and put themselves forward to stand for public office, both locally and nationally. So that, that really comes down to saying, hey, local members, which you remember, incredibly right wing, you elect your members, which, okay, I, again, I'm, I'm not too much in, in, in opposed to that idea, but you've got to remember where the membership of the party is and what a mess that is in itself in as well. So there is a lot of really bad and radical things that could, I think, come from that. And I think it will backfire on the Tories very, very much so. Uh, I would also now help to raise the expected standards of candidates, but crucially allow associations to interview and select the candidates that they want. Once selected, CCSQ would work with the candidates to develop uh, business and campaign plans to fundraise, secure pledges, uh, and engage with the public. So that's what they are really trying to do. And once again, they are trying to go back to these key seats and have all that up and running by 2026 to be ready for the next conservative ele for like the next election. But again, what policies are you going to be running? What is it exactly you are going to do that's different? That sells incredibly well with your current membership, but what about the wider British public? So far, Patel hasn't really said anything. None of them have really said too much about that. But let's finish this off, this last part. So democratizing our party goes far beyond electing a chair and giving our members and association greater say over candidate selections. It is also about embedding a culture of member engagement in the development of policies and making our party conference now a showcase event for the membership and not corporate interests. And once again, becoming a mass membership movement which reflects our values, our conservative values, which I believe are shared by the majority of British people. Um, depends what those conservative values are, um, because you'll notice she hasn't actually said what those particular conservative values are. Um, you know. <laughs> uh, anyway, we must now draw a line in our sand for our recent past as we now try to earn back the trust of the British people uh, and the right to be heard by them. We must now start by empowering those in the party with our row set with pride and our members who will now come out rain or shine, knocking on doors, campaigning for our party. Um, that's all very nice for a, a local and leadership campaign, but there's nothing there which says, once again, how does that win back the membership of your party? How does this win back the, the trust of, of the British people? What exactly policies is Patel going to push uh, on this? Um, It's really, really strange that, that they are sort of really trying to push this. Um, it's it's honestly really strange, but the, again, this this is this is an interesting comment here. So all reasonable and good stuff as a set of party mechanics, but it does not go to the heart of the matter and still very uh, the recent spectacular failure. Cool. Again, good point. It doesn't. Um, while I do appreciate the candidates cannot be uh, easily be honest in an election campaign, there is now a fundamental need to win back members and former members by hanging out the dirty washing bag for debate because it is the only way that that debate will now uh, help clear a pick up clear get clear the winner we know uh, we will know if the party actually gets it and unless it is clear that that vision and direction for the party uh, party politically in its stance and ethos is not correct then you will have completely lost at the first hurdle it is about destination as much as how you get there that's why I've said throughout all that, where's the policy? What is exactly she's going to do? Very nice for, you know, party members. But when you are looking at the, you know, appealing to the wider British public, you know, then what? What, what are you going to offer? 
Uh, if the destination is completely wrong, then no one will be interested in how you actually get there. But as the 1922 committee does not want to have that debate by censoring of candidates with a yellow card process, it looks like no candidate is actually going to win anyone back until the party is now willing to be honest with itself and hereby its members and particularly past members. Interesting, very interesting comment there. Um, like I say, it's, it's always very interesting reading some of these comments because uh, there are some um, interesting stuff on that. Um, I I really don't think Priti Patel is going to win. Uh, I think that is very much a pitch to the membership, but they're not there yet. It's still very much trying to win MPs, and at the moment, it's it's what you're going to offer these MPs. What what is it like? What policies are you going to do? So far, not no one's talking about policies. No one is shockingly talking about policies. Maybe as as we roll on a couple of weeks maybe we will see that and interestingly enough we are now seeing some conservatives actually start to panic that this contest is going to go on a bit too long because they can already tell that this self-reflection period that they had hoped because it would be a long leadership election that would happen is not happening so they are now worried that actually a long contest could be even more damaging than a short contest and are now trying to get this shortened um, so that they can try and get someone in before September so that they have someone to then respond to the first budget. Because if you have seen Rishi Sunak, he has been completely MIA. He's he's checked out already as, as far as he is concerned. He ain't, he ain't around anymore. But... We'll see what happens with that if they do decide to shorten it. But I'll tell you this now, Patel's plan, that could backfire massively, massively so, because the party is absolutely very, very much becoming increasingly you know, right-wing in its in its views. Well, the party membership is becoming increasingly right-wing in its views. That's why it is elected. You know, furthermore, you know, right wingers. That's why you've had Tom Tugendhat had to come out and do what he did to say, "Oh yeah, we're going to leave the European Court of Human Rights," which bizarrely has now left James Cleverly looking like the cleverest one in the room, being the only leadership candidate to actually say, "No, we should not leave that because it would be a really bad idea." And who knew? Thinking, you know, I'd be here saying that James Cleverly has a good idea. <laughs> Oh no, Tory leadership contests. Strange things, aren't they? But as always, thank you very much for watching. And of course, as always, we'll see you all next time.